So how many of you already have your house decorated for Christmas? Raise your hand, all right? There you go. How many of you are late? Raise your hand. Okay, there you go. All right. So I love Christmas time. I love Christmas decorations. We're still working on ours, uh, but I love it. And I love it uh, when, this is what we used to do. Uh, we used to have on Christmas Eve, uh, we would have a meal. Then we'd have a birthday cake for Jesus. And uh, we, we would put only one candle on it because it would burn the house down if we put 2,000 candles on it. But anyway, uh, we'd have our birthday cake for Jesus and we'd sing happy birthday to Jesus. And then we'd get in our car and we'd go around the neighborhood and look at Christmas lights. Anybody do that? All right, that's right. We're teaching our kids to judge you on your house. <laughs> to place judgment on you. Now, if your house is over the top, my kids loved it. I mean, the houses that were really over the top, they were the best, and we loved them. Kind of like this house right up here. Throw that thing up there. All right, I like that. All right. How many of you, how many of you like that house? Woo! All right. I like that house. Now, now, keep that up there. That house has everything, doesn't it? I mean, it has it. Look at that picture real close. On the top, there's angels. There's angels up there. Uh, there's Santa. He's on the second roof. If you look way down to the left-hand corner, there's Santa in an airplane. There's a Grinch right under the porch. You've got to have a Grinch and Santa, all right? And then if you'll notice, right at the bottom, there's a manger scene, all right? It's there. The manger scene is there. Now, I love houses like that. I love people to go all out. But here's a, here's a little problem with that. If we're not careful, then we'll put Jesus on the same level, on the mystical level or the magical level of, of Santa and the Grinch and Rudolph and all of that. And we know better than that because as we said last week, the story of Jesus being born is absolutely real. It's uh, real people, real time, real places. You don't even have to be a Bible believer. Uh, you don't even have to be a believer to know that Jesus came, that he was born in Bethlehem. Uh, there were real people and times that are surrounding that. You can Google it. I mean, the book of Acts tells us that, uh, that Jesus was not born in a corner, uh, that it was for the world to see. So Jesus, the birth of Jesus, is absolutely not only spiritual fact, but is absolutely historical fact uh, as well. Now, out of all of the traditions that we do, there's probably nothing that brings out the truth of the Christmas story better than Christmas carols. Uh, that's why I love them. Uh, every year, uh, even totally secular radio stations at Christmas time, some of them will change their whole format to nothing but Christmas songs. Now, obviously, because they're secular stations, then our heart and our mind gets filled with Mariah Carey singing, All I Want for Christmas is You. Uh, I know Mariah's watching right now. I'm sure of that. So, Mariah, let me just tell you, all I want for Christmas is for you to stop singing that song. Can I get an amen, all right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Save your emails. All right. Uh, of course, you know, you got Bing singing White Christmas. Can you ever get really tired of White Christmas? Nobody can get tired of White Christmas, man, especially if you're in the South. Uh, hang on there, man. We may have one. We had one 10 years ago. It may happen again. Uh, if a snowflake falls in the south, I love it. Everything shuts down. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So uh, it's just we can't wait. Uh, but anyway, uh, but then even on those totally secular stations, they can't get away from throwing in there a silent night or joy to the world or a, a Christmas carol. And so many of them have the plain gospel in these carols is amazing. Now, as you know, in this series, we're featuring a carol each week. Last week, we featured one. We're going to do that this week. Let me give you kind of a backstory uh, on the carol that uh, we're going to get ready to introduce today. It has a very interesting story behind it. It was written in 1847 by a French poet whose name was Placide Capote. Uh, he was an unbeliever. He was a well-known poet. But a priest approached him and said, listen, I need a poem to finish out my Christmas Eve Mass. And so uh, Chapeau wrote a poem, very famous poem now. Uh, he wrote it for the Christmas Eve Mass, and he liked it so much that he said, this needs to be set to music. So he had a good friend who was a famous composer who was Jewish. And so together they collaborated in writing this Christmas carol. 
And it became and is one of the most favorite Christmas carols that we have. But when you think about it, it was written by an unbelieving poet and a Jewish songwriter. And yet it became one of the most popular Christmas carols of all time. Now, when the Catholic Church realized that the song was written by an unbeliever and it was also a Jewish songwriter, the Catholic Church banned the song from ever being sung at Christmas Eve Mass. And, but it was too late. The song had already become popular, and, uh, and so people started singing it in the streets. little side note to this, uh, in, in 1906, a Canadian inventor uh, uh, did the first AM radio program in history, and he did it on Christmas Eve. And this live radio program on AM from Canada, uh, he read the Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2, and then he took out his violin and he played this Christmas carol. This Christmas carol, believe it or not, was the very first song to be played on the radio. And you just think about that, that was written by an unbelieving poet and a Jewish composer. And it's what God takes and makes to get the message out. And it's an amazing thing. How many of you have a manger scene in your house? You have a manger scene in your house? Okay, all right. We have a manger scene in our house. I want them to throw that uh, up there. I want to show you this is our manger scene. Uh, and uh, we've had it uh, for a while. Uh, and it's special to us. It didn't, may not look like much to you guys. Uh, so can y'all throw that up there for There it is. Okay. Um, now... That, uh, that manger scene is special to us. It doesn't look like much to y'all, but uh, uh, it was made for us. It was handmade, hand-painted for us back in 1979, and uh, I was three years old. And uh, no, that's not true. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was made for us, for me, Phyllis and I, and this is before we had children or anything. No, 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 John, John was really small. But anyway, uh, and so uh, it was made in 79. Uh, by a couple in Eastway Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's special to us. And so we put that we put that out there, uh, and it's uh, it's special to us. Uh, and it's all there. Uh, it's all in place. Uh, Phyllis has kind of a prescribed way the way she likes to display that, and so it's all ceramic. And so uh, you can't tell it right now, uh, but there's a whole lot of super glue involved in this uh, manger scene over the years. But it's all there. The shepherds are there. You can see them, the wise men, Joseph and Mary, uh, little baby Jesus. The little baby Jesus is in, the, is in the manger. The cows are there lowing. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I thought cows mooed, but maybe in 1847 they lowed. I don't know. Anyway, the cows are there and the sheep is there. It's a manger scene, and we love it. But the bottom line is that manger scene is clean. It doesn't smell bad. There's no uh, stuff to pick up after. Uh, it's all there. It's clean. It's all in place. And, uh, and I know for you purists, the wise men are not really supposed to be there. The wise men did not. Uh, show up at the manger scene. I know, I know that burst some of your bubbles, but read your Bible very carefully. Jesus was already a young child uh, before the wise men came, but hey, deal with it. Uh, we like to put that out, and so should you, and so we, it's all a reminder. Uh, but it's all clean, and it's all in place. But the bottom line is, on that first holy night, it was anything but clean, and it was anything but in place. Matter of fact, nothing in the life of Joseph and Mary seemed to be falling into place. Now we know that the angel Gabriel had came to Mary and, and told Mary she was going to have a child. Now uh, she, uh, she was a virgin. Now some people try to interpret that and say, well, that just means a young woman. No, no, no. She knew she'd never, she'd never had a relationship with a man. As a matter of fact, if you're here today and you have doubts about the virgin birth, and this world does, let me remind you that the first person that ever doubted the virgin birth was Mary herself. And she said, how can this be? I've never known a man. And the angel said, listen, let me tell you something. God's going to do it. And just remember this. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Am I talking to anybody here today that knows God can do anything? Amen? God can do anything. And so she believes God. And then we have a whole bunch of verses in Luke chapter 1 where Mary sings a song to God. And, 
and it's called her Magnificant, and, and she praises God for the promise that she's going to carry the long-awaited Messiah, the Deliverer. And so she's embraced what God's going to do in her life. And then after that, it all falls apart. Maybe I'm talking to somebody today. Maybe, maybe you felt like God wanted you to go in a certain direction in your life, and, and you really prayed about it, and you really thought God was in it, and, 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 and God showed you something maybe through the Bible, or, or you stepped out on faith, and you think, man, you know, this is what God wants. And, and the moment that you did that, things just didn't fall into place. Does that mean that God wasn't in it? No, not at all. God's ways are not our ways. And so Mary embraced the truth of it, but then it all falls apart. She goes to Joseph. Now, you got to, I mean, what kind of story is this? Now, Joseph, I know we're engaged. And by the way, engagement back in Bible times was not like engagement today, man. You couldn't, you couldn't break up on your wedding day. It was legal. It was binding. And only a divorce could separate you. And she goes to Joseph. They were espoused. And she says, Joseph, I'm, I'm going to have a baby. But hey, 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 I've never done anything with anybody, you know. And so he's got to believe that mess. He's got to believe that. And so he wants, to, he wants to divorce her. He wants to put her away privately. Now, he could have her stoned if he wanted to legally by the law, but of course he didn't want to do that. He loved Mary. Broke his heart. And so he embraces it. The Holy Spirit of God said, Joseph, what Mary's telling you is the truth. This is going to happen. And so together they embrace the truth of the Christmas message that Messiah is going to come and Mary's going to carry this baby. And, and so for nine months, they had to suffer ridicule from their families and their friends. Nobody's going to believe that. Everybody thought Joseph was an idiot and, and everybody thought Mary was a liar. And, and they suffered through all that. And so now she's nine months pregnant. It seems like, well, maybe we're going to get through this after all. And then comes this census that Caesar Augustus is going to take up. And everybody's got to go back to their land of their ancestors and go back and be taxed. And for Joseph, it was Bethlehem of Judea. Now, that trip uh, is from Nazareth to uh, Jerusalem. It's a 90-mile trip. Now, that doesn't seem like much today. Uh, today, you get in your car, you can drive 90 miles an hour and a half. If you're riding with me, it takes a lot less. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? But the bottom line is, it was a tough trip, and it's all the way up. It's all the way uphill. Dangerous. And she's nine months pregnant, but God's been watching over them. They're getting through this. Nothing's happened along the way in that nine days, and she hasn't delivered yet. So maybe there's a little bit of hope. So they get to Jerusalem, and maybe they're thinking, hey, listen, she's carrying, she's carrying the Son of God. God's going God's to protect us. God's going to provide for us. So they get to Bethlehem, and they find out everything's so crowded. There's no place for anybody to stay. And maybe they're thinking, hey, hey, Son of God coming through here. Wife's carrying the Son of God. Jesus, here he is. How about somebody giving us a place? Son of God, been born right here. Nobody does anything. Nobody says anything. Nobody thinks anything. And forget that Jesus is being born. I mean, doesn't it seem strange to you? Nobody would even turn a hand to do anything for a pregnant woman, nine months pregnant. What kind of world is that? It was a lot like the world we lived in. It was messy. Nothing's fallen into place. It, it, listen, this night is not holy. And so then they find a cave. Now, I don't want to burst your bubble about, but if you've ever been to the Holy Land, uh, there's just not any wood in the Holy Land very much. It's all rocks. It's all caves. And so Jesus more than likely was not born in a wooden stable uh, with clean hay and all that. It was a cave. It was a grotto. And, uh, and so he was born in a cave where animals were and had to had be placed in a manger, which is nothing but a feeding trough or a watering trough for cows and sheep and goats and all of that. Son of God. Being born. Listen, this night was anything but holy. This night, if you would ask Joseph and Mary, was nothing more than a disaster. Maybe you're feeling that way. I think this message is for somebody today. Maybe you're feeling like your life is a disaster. Maybe you feel like nothing's fallen into place for me. Nothing's holy about this Christmas season for me. Nothing's holy about Christmas for me. I dread Christmas. And so that's the way it was. And then, but then, all of a sudden, here come these guys these shepherds, and they come from up. They're walking up the hill in the shepherd's field right outside of Bethlehem, and they begin to tell Joseph and Mary about some angels that had appeared to them, and it scared them to death. But it said that Jesus the, the, will find a child who, 
who, uh, who's going to save the people from their sin. The Messiah has come. And they said, if we go up this way, we're going to find a baby. And there he is. And they fall down. And they worship him. So now Joseph and Mary have their confirmation. And all of a sudden, now that night becomes holy. It becomes holy. You know, as a, as a kid, uh, raised, I, I went to church some. Uh, our parents, you know, we, we were kind of the, Christ, uh, the Christmas and Easter crowd. We were part of that. But I always felt sorry for Jesus. I, already, I, I felt sorry for that first Christmas. I mean, they didn't have a Christmas tree. They, they, didn't have, they didn't have any presents. I mean, I just felt, man, how boring is that? I, I feel sorry. Their, their Christmas ain't nothing like ours. But then I got to thinking, no, no, no. They got the greatest gift that ever, has ever been given. I know, I know what you're saying. You said, well, the greatest gift ever been given, salvation. Well, they got, they got that. They got the promise of salvation. But they got more than that. They got hope. And that's the greatest thing. And, and all this world, they, and, and Joseph and Mary got, got confirmation that they were on the right track of what God was doing in their life. Now, there's a line in that song that Jason just sang, and I want ever for us to forget it, and every time from now on that you sing, Oh, Holy Night, I want, you to, I want this one line to stick out in your heart and your mind, and it goes like this, a thrill of hope. Everybody say thrill of hope. A thrill, and that's what hope is. Hope ought to be a thrill. He said, a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Come on, everybody, listen to me. Listen to me. Or listen to me say amen. Come on. How many of you know we live in a weary world, right? Aren't you weary? Aren't you tired of all the bad news? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just get weary. I'm, I'm, I'm weary. I get tired of bad news. I get weary and tired of all the distrust. I get weary and tired of the prejudices in this in this country and the distrust I get I get weary and tired of politically correctness oh my soul I get I get weary and tired of politics and politicians and and all of that I get weary and tired and so are you I just get weary and tired of it it's it's a weary world that we live in but because of Jesus the hymn writer all of a sudden the the carol the, the poet says listen wait a minute because of Jesus there's a thrill of something there's a thrill of hope. And, and I want to remind you today, somebody needs this today. There's nothing greater for your future than to have hope in your life. And all God's people said, to have hope. That's what your future is all about. If you're a born again, blood bolt child of God, if you know Jesus as your Savior, yes, 10,000 times yes, your sin is forgiven. 10,000 times yes, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And 10,000 times yes, heaven is your home. But I'm going to tell you right here on this earth, because of Jesus, you can face tomorrow and all God's people say it. Now, there's somebody else that realized that. And he lived in a weary world. He lived in a hopeless world. His name is Jeremiah. We call him the weeping prophet. Jeremiah wrote something in the book of Lamentations. So take your Bible, turn your Bible, turn your Bible on, whatever you need to do. Go to the book of Lamentations. And I know when you woke up this morning, some of you were thinking, I hope pastor preaches out of Lamentations today. I just love that book. I've got it memorized. No, you didn't do that. That's why I'm giving you a moment to find it. Even, even, on, even on your iPad, it's under L, Lamentations, all right? But I want you to look at Lamentations chapter 3. Now, everybody look up here just a moment. Jerusalem has fallen. God said it would. God told Jeremiah and Isaiah and some of the prophets, said, you tell Israel that if they don't repent and turn around, I've been good to them. I chose them. They're my people. And if they don't turn around, judgment is coming. And it's coming under the hand of an oppressor. It's coming under the hand of somebody overtaking Jerusalem and making Jerusalem slaves. You tell them it's coming. It doesn't have to come. But if they don't turn this thing around, it's coming. Not because I don't love them, but because I do love them. But you tell them. And they did tell them. And they were faithful. And Israel did not listen. Now it happened. Now it happened. Jerusalem has fallen. Jeremiah wakes up. And all of a sudden, Babylon has come. King Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed Jerusalem and taken the, the best of the best out of Jerusalem as captives and taken them to Babylon. How would you feel? How would you feel this morning? This, this is the exact same scenario. Uh, scenario. How would you feel tomorrow if, if, if that crazy Kim jong Yu, whatever his name is, rocket man, 
How would you feel if one of those rockets succeeded and uh, Los Angeles or even now Washington, D.C. was in oblivion and we got up and we found out that China was not uh, for us, that China was behind it all, all along. And now we wake up under a red flag. We wake up and we're under a dictator. And life as we know it is no longer. Don't you think that'd be a weary? Would you think the world's weary right now? How would you? I would, I would, and everything you've ever known, all of the freedoms you, you and I have ever known, we don't have them anymore. Well, that's how Jeremiah found himself. And by the way, it happened literally, it happened overnight. Now, God said it was coming. God said, listen, you, you need to turn this thing around. You need to get right. It doesn't have to come, but it did. And so Jeremiah wakes up to that world. And you're talking about a weary world. You're talking about a hopeless situation. That's what he wakes up to. But for some reason, God speaks some hope to him. He realizes something, and his outlook totally, completely changes. Everybody look at verse 20. Lamentations chapter 3, and look at verse 20. And he said, my soul still remembers. In other words, Jeremiah said, I'm not hiding my head in the sand. I know what kind of world I live in. I know what kind of culture we live in. I'm not, I'm not sweet, you know, pie in the sky by and by. This is not praise the Lord anyhow. I know where I'm living. I know what world we're living in. He said, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. My heart is burdened. My, my heart is broken. My soul sinks within me. That's the kind of world I live in. Look at verse 21. This I recall to my mind. Now, now understand that. He said, I'm going to claim. Everybody listen to me. He said, I'm going to claim something that everything within me does not want to uh, claim. There's not one circumstance within me that wants to claim this, but something comes to my mind. A truth comes to my mind, and I'm going to claim this no matter what my circumstances are. Somebody here today, several of you here today, you need to do that. You're in a situation where you think it's hopeless. You're in a situation where you're just wore down, you're beat down, and you're weary, and you need to sit up, and you need to claim something, and you have to tell yourself to claim something. You even have to make yourself claim something, but it's the truth. And Jeremiah said, I'm going to claim something. Something comes to my mind that I'm going to claim. I don't feel like claiming it, but I'm going to claim it. And when he did, it brought all kinds of hope into his life. Well, what in the world was it that he claimed? And we find it in verse 22. He said, through the Lord's mercies. Some translations say, through his great love, we're not consumed. I'm still living. God didn't kill me in the middle of the night. I woke up this morning, and I'm still living, and I'm still breathing. Yes, I may not be living in the circumstance I want to be living in. Nothing has changed, but I'm still living. And because I'm still living means that God gave to me another breath of life. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what he said. He said, through the Lord's mercies, through his great love, we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Child of God, listen and listen well today. You woke up today. You're in church today. You're in a great church today. You're in church. You're hearing singing and preaching and teaching and fellowship. You got here this morning, and I know your situation may not be everything you want it to be, but I'm telling you, you're here because God in his grace and mercy brought you here, and it's fresh and knew everyone. There ought not be a child of God where you say, the day is the same old, same old. It's the same thing every day. No, every day in Jesus is new and fresh. Glory to his name. Somebody give God praise and glory. I just preached my watch off. Thank you, baby. I'm watching, I preach my watch off, baby. I, listen, that's some good preaching when you preach your watch off. Can I get an amen? Now, that might mean trouble for y'all because I got no time right now. <laughs> Every day ought to be a new day. And this is, this, is, this is what Jeremiah said. He said, oh, listen, man, I'm living in a weary world, but I'm just telling you there's hope for today. It ain't over yet. I got breath of life. God has been good to me. His mercy. And this, all of a sudden, Jeremiah starts talking about his mercies. Jeremiah is saying, listen, we got justice. We got as a nation what we deserved. 
And I'm telling you right now, we're getting what we deserve to. You can't kill all the babies we've been killing throughout the years and all this mess. You can't keep calling wrong and right and right and wrong and get away with it. Somebody say amen. Amen. And Jeremiah said, we got what we deserve. But bless God, we get more than that. We get mercy from God. How many of you are thankful for God's mercy this morning? Amen. Thankful for his mercy. Yes. I don't want justice. I know people crying out, well, it's just not just. We, live, we don't live in a just world. I don't want justice, man. I need mercy. I, justice is what I deserve. I don't want to get what I deserve. I want to get mercy. Can, I say, can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Years ago, I, uh, I was late. I, I was preaching here, and I had a revival to do at another church way up in the mountains. And I had a little tiny window before that service started. And so I got away from here, and I was, and I was, I wasn't, I wasn't driving fast. I was flying low. (laughs) Somebody know what I'm talking about? And he got me. State patrolman. He got me. I saw the blue light. I'm, I'm running late. Church is expecting me. So I pulled over. He, uh, he motions for me to get out of my car to come into the patrol car. It was a cold day. And so I get in the patrol car. I kid you not. I opened the door, and when I got in, gospel music was playing in that brother's car. And I thought, yes. I'm going to get a little bit of mercy today. Was I guilty? Oh, you better believe I was guilty. But I'm going to get some mercy and I got kind of excited. I handed him my license. And he said, sir, uh, you know you were tr- driving too fast. I said, yes, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, and, I, and I apologize. But I'm a preacher. <laughs> and I'm going to preach a revival. And I was just running late. And I'm sorry. He said, you're a preacher? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you a gospel preacher? I said, yes, sir. He said, I mean, do you really preach Jesus? I said, yes, sir, I preach Jesus. He said, do you preach that Jesus is the only way to heaven? I said, yes, sir, I preach Jesus is the only way. He said, you preach the blood and that there is no salvation in any other and that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? I said, yes, sir, that's exactly what I preach. He said, glory to God. He said, that's wonderful, preacher. And I think, here comes the mercy. Here it comes. I didn't get it. He hands me the ticket. He said, preacher, listen to me. I know you're going to heaven when you die. I believe that. But just because you're going to heaven when you die doesn't give you the right to drive like a bat out of hell. He said, have a good day. I said, too late. Then I remembered we have a policeman in our church, and I got some mercy anyway. But anyway, so, 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 so Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, he said, listen, he said, yes, we got justice, but we get mercy from God, and his mercies are new every single morning. Am I talking to anybody? I know your situation may be bad. I know, I'm not making light of your situation. I'm just telling you, Jesus is on the throne, and if you're a child of God, we have hope. I don't just have he- hope for my heaven later on. I got hope for today and hope for tomorrow. And let me tell you why. Because God's already in my tomorrow. How many of you believe God's here today? Say a big amen. Well, if God is here today, bless God, he's there tomorrow. And all God's people said... And that's what Jeremiah gets excited. But then he starts talking about God. He starts talking to God. And he says, God, great is your faithfulness. He changes, his, he changes his attention. He said, God, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, and my, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. And by the way, you'll notice he had to tell himself that. There are times you just got, he says, says my soul. He had to tell himself that. Well, the time's run out. Let me, let me, just, let me just say this. Let me, give you, let me give you two things that will bring hope into your weary world, and then we'll be out of here. Number one, Jesus brings hope knowing exactly what we need. How many of you know that? Now, listen, I didn't say Jesus gives us exactly what we want. He gives us exactly what we need. Verse 24 says, the Lord is my portion. He said, says my soul. You see, Jeremiah's telling himself that. And sometimes you've got to tell yourself that. 
I mean, I know you're waiting on God to reveal that to you, and you're just, you know, and you're praying, and you're. But sometimes you just got to tell yourself, "Listen, God, I'm going to claim. I'm going to claim your promises. Your promises are true because you said so, whether I feel like it or not." Too many of you are basing your Christian life on how you feel, and I wouldn't give you a plug nickel on your feelings. Your feelings are fickle. Can I get an amen? He said, "I got to tell my soul this, and you got to tell yours. I have to tell my soul that." He said, "Therefore, I hope in Him. You're my portion." I, I think. I think Jeremiah is. Uh, he's, he's talking. He, he's looking back at at the manna from heaven, how God provided manna from heaven and how he did it every day. You see, you couldn't stock up manna. You could, you, when, man, when God provided the manna in heaven in, in, in the book of Exodus, you couldn't pile it up. You had to get it fresh and new every single day or it'd go bad, it'd go bad by the end of the day. And God is just saying, listen, you've got to trust me every single day. I will give you what you need. Not, not, not necessarily what you want, but trust me. I know what you need more than what you want. Anybody ever got anything you really wanted, and when you got it, you found out you really didn't need it? You ever done that? Years ago, I got a motorcycle. I did. Now, I know we got motorcycle guys in our church, man. These, I mean, we're talking about real motorcycles. I love, I love our motorcycle ministry. I love the guys in our motorcycle ministry. I love the fact that they're starting to help us out with some security, and I love to see the 930 crowd when those motorcycle guys walk in that church over there, man. It's awesome. <laughs> See, you guys know them, Nick and those guys. By the way, CR, not this Monday, but next Monday, we're going to ordain Nick as a gospel preacher in the ministry. Isn't that awesome? So, I love that ministry that these guys do, man. But they're real motorcycles. I had, well, it had a motor and it had two wheels. And I was a youth pastor, and I told my wife, I said, Phyllis, I want to get me a motorcycle because I'm a youth pastor, and how cool would it be for the youth pastor to go to events on a motorcycle? And I thought it was cool. And she said, have you prayed about it? I said, sure. I hadn't prayed about it. I just wanted one. I thought it would be cool. And so uh, I, got, I got my motorcycle. I looked ridiculous on that little thing. You say, how do you know? Because my wife said, you look ridiculous on that thing. <laughs> I look like a can of busted biscuits. <laughs> Just hanging over. Just... You couldn't even see a seat. It's just... It was horrible. I got that motorcycle, and it gave me nothing but trouble. The rest of the time I had it. Matter of fact, it got stolen. Police department calls me up and says, Reverend Eisenhower, we have your motorcycle. You want to come pick it up? I said, sure. So I went down there to pick it up. I kid you not, I'm not lying. This ain't preaching. I'm telling the truth right now. <laughs> they put a box on the counter and said, there it is. It was in all kinds of little pieces. It had been picked clean. Now here's the kicker on that. I had to make payments on that for two years. And every time I wrote that check, I said, I wrote the check for the money. And then I said, I will pray about things from now on. <laughs> I will pray about things from now on. I got something I wanted, but I didn't need it. And Jeremiah says, God, you're my portion. You know what I need. I know what I want, but God, you know what I need. And then lastly, lastly, Jesus brings us the hope to keep going. He brings us hope to keep going. Listen to what he said in verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. Everything don't fall into place. My manger seen in my house, all in place. It's all clean. But everything don't always fall into place. Your life don't always fall into place. Joseph and Mary's life don't always fall into place. That was, that was not a holy night. It was a disaster night as far as they were concerned. But he said, if, hey, if you wait for God, he said, God will bless. And, and the soul that seeks him, God will bless. You see, it all depends on who you're putting your hope in. How many of you know this sin-sick world right now we live in is putting their hope in the wrong things. And they're putting their hope in the wrong people. And God says, no, you put your hope in me. I'll give you hope. I'll give you a future. We live in a weary world. And God says, I'll give you hope. Uh, somebody said this. They said, you can live about 40 days without food. You can live about four, I mean, four days without water. But you can't live one minute without hope. And all God's people said. 
You know what people do? They're hopeless. They kill themselves. And God says, listen, there's always hope. There's always hope. That's why it's a thrill. The thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. Is the greatest Christmas gift you could ever get. The greatest one ever is to have some hope in your life. So, the series is called Carols, Sermons That You Can Sing. So sing this with me. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, oh, night, when Christ was born. Oh, night divine, oh, night, oh, night divine. It became a holy night because Jesus was born, the promised one. And what made that a holy night? In all the mess. It's the same thing that can bring holiness and hope to your home and into your world. And all God's people said, Amen. every head is bowed, every eye is closed. What about you? Somebody needed this today. I don't know who you are, but I think several of you needed this today. What about you? You're here today and you say, preacher, I needed that. Maybe you're in, a, maybe you're in a, a, a situation you feel like it's hopeless and you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe you're just weary. You're in a weary world and you're facing, you know, for so many people, Christmas is not joyful. It's weary. You've got to face some family members and situations you're not looking forward to. But you've got to tell yourself. You've got to remind yourself of the promises of God and say, God, I'm going to claim the fact that that your faithfulness and that your hope and that your mercies are new every day. And I'm going to put my hope in you and you alone.